Hey, what do you know? I got them both going. Start the stream over here. I think I got the mics turned up. Give me a test. One, two, three, Rob Thomas. One, two, three, sir. Awesome. I don't think I need this, but I'll leave it up anyways, because I think I've had it up. How do I look? Perfect. Very patriotic. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to come in like that, but those things are hot. Steam up oh, your yeah. glasses. My brother, what's going on? You know what? Here's the thing. I have, I don't have lots of people that, you know, bang on me to get on my show. Uh, you asked some time ago and I can't remember. I was trying to tell the story to a friend of mine today. I'm like, I think I politely rebuffed him. You know, I don't know. I, did, I asked him like, well, what are we can talk about, bro? Like, seriously, I, you know who I interview. I don't interview guys like you. <laughs> something like that i don't know and then i get a facebook message or a text from me i think it was a facebook message hey dude i'm a top fan of the jim fannin show page does that get me on the show right. <laughs> Man, I can't. maybe i gotta pay some extra attention to my boy rob thomas because he's got a point i don't think the jim fannin show has another top fan to be i don't know i'm sure i can check but well, I, I do check into the show on a regular basis and watch it. So, oh, cool! Well, I appreciate that. So, tell uh, the listeners or viewers, depending on what platform they're watching on right now, because I will put this up in the podcast too once I get it figured out. I can't find a uh, YouTube to MP3 converter. I used to have a, a couple online sites that did it for me. I can't do that but anyway. So, I haven't updated the podcast in a while. Sorry, folks, but I, I'm getting to it. True dot tube is going to be launched soon. My guest is. Rob Thomas, give us a short little brief intro about who Rob Thomas is. A little mini bio? Yeah, yeah. Well, let's see here. Uh, born and raised in St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada. Uh, went to high school in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Ooh. Moved from Hamilton to New York City for about 10 years, uh, living in Tribeca. Uh, moved back in, I think, 2005, uh, and uh, that's soon thereafter that's when we kind of met um and i am a local financial advisor here in the city specializing in financial planning for you know investments and insurance for business owners and professionals cool so what ages were you in new york city 25 to 35 cool what'd you do <laughs> what didn't i do ah uh, goodness gracious um Service industry, first and foremost, uh, okay. bartending, special events, stuff like that. Um, I started off as a, a, a server and a bartender, just going from uh, restaurants or bars, clubs. And then uh, I got into special events where you're basically a, a gun for hire. You've got a, a white tux, a black tux, and you're, you're hired as an independent contractor, sent to whatever party it is, it's a five hour gig, two hours set up, two hours breakdown, one hour, uh, two hours set up, two hours party, one hour breakdown. And that could be anything from fashion week or active parties, um, Grammys, active parties, Hamptons, weddings, uh, whatever. Park Unless Avenue. Those are cool parties. stories. Of doing oh yeah. That game. Oh yeah. You, you meet a lot of people in that city, right? I mean, if you're, if you're one for stargazing, um, it, it's, uh, it gets pretty routine and mundane after a while, um, just bumping into serving, going to parties or whatever, socially or working on. Hmm. What's your impression? What are you left with as an impression of the city? As far, I mean, you've been to a few big cities, New York City, I guess you spent the most time in, but you know, especially with what's going on now, democratically, Democrat run mayor, governor, uh, coronavirus hotspot, the, yeah. whole, the old, old age home thing, but tell us a little bit about how, when you left, the culture of New York City kind of left you. And it really did. It, it, it was a combination of things, actually, because when I was there for the duration, almost the duration, it was basically Giuliani and, and Bloomberg. So there you've got two Republican um, mayors. Ideologically, I think they're very different, but the way they ran the city from a legal perspective, uh, crime perspective, it was a very safe town, very safe city. I had maybe two incidents of a crime related situation, but um, I did return uh, several times and I have and will continue to do so to visit friends and stuff. But my uh, my big striking contrast was last 
either last August or the August before um, visiting friends and the city and the energy has completely changed. And uh, I looked into it after I got back and it's just that era was just widely regarded, which um, just by luck or my luck anyways, um, as kind of the last great era of New York as far as nightlife goes. And the reason being is then, like I was working in the service industry, that was $25 an hour American then, right? So that's good money, even more better gigs. And you make a ton of money working three nights a week at any restaurant or bar worth its salt. You could be an actress, a singer, a model, or uh, just somebody who wanted to get out of their small town like myself and come to New York and live in Manhattan. My rent was about 600 bucks a month for a, 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 the master bedroom of a townhouse. And you could basically work and, and then go out at night and have a great time. And it would, I always consider it to be kind of like a, a working vacation. Now, that's, that's impossible. From an economic perspective, the rents have gone through the, through the roof. You're not, going to, you're not going to live in Manhattan um, making the kind of money myself and other colleagues uh, were then and live in Manhattan and have money to enjoy your life or whatever. It's just impossible now. The rent controls have been eliminated there, which I was living in a rent control building a lot were, so they were dropping off. And so now, yeah, if you're not, if you're not prepared to pay about $3,500 for uh, uh, the same amount of space I was getting, there's no way you're living in Manhattan. And if you're not living in Manhattan, um, then that basically, from what I understand from friends who still live there and work in the, the upper end restaurants, it's just all... Uh, foreigners have bought up the condos and everything like that, the property, or they come into the city and they work. There's no scene in Manhattan anymore. Even the high-end restaurants, people, people don't want it. They don't want the five-star, four-star white tablecloth deal anymore. That energy is just not there, you know, anymore. The American psycho, which was the late eighties and then the nineties and the, the, the first half of the two thousands, that's it. It's finished. Now you get more excitement in scene in Brooklyn, Williamsburg, uh, or Queens uh, than you would in, in, in the heydays of Manhattan and Southern Manhattan specifically. So what are your, what are your thoughts on what's going on there now in all New York city? I mean, you must have a soft spot in your heart for that, the old days. And I've heard that before and I didn't, you know, I've just been turned on to American politics since Trump, like seriously. And it was slow. It wasn't just because he was elected. It was like, I just promised myself with Trump, I wasn't going to, uh, expend any hate on him because I know what hating a politician is like. It, it, it takes up your life almost, you know what I mean? Cause I'm wildly passionate about politics. Mm -hmm. You know, you know I, I had, when I was a lefty, I had that for Harper. He was ripping up regulations and tossing libraries in the trash and, and, and it just, as a green, it, it was offensive to me. And uh, I was so glad to see him go that I was hopeful that when Trudeau came in with his whole mushy gender parody thing and walk, I was still hopeful. I still gave Trudeau a chance, even though I knew, I knew he wasn't the smartest guy in the world and he's put great people around him. I'll give him credit for that, but he's written the coattails of his father's name essentially and just rose to the ranks because of his looks. He's not, he's not bright. And anyone that's spoken to the man for two sentences knows he, he can barely carry a conversation if he's off script type of thing. He's probably much better now because he's memorized the scripts and he's kind of a, a drama student anyways. But, uh, uh, you know, I just, I don't know. Now I'm rambling. What the hell? Was, where was I going with that? I was trying to get to what your thoughts on what's going down. Oh yeah. So what it was, what sent me down that road was, you know, I wasn't familiar with Giuliani and Bloomberg, but I heard they were tough on crime. The, the what would they call it? Carding and stop and frisk or whatever. Stop and they, frisk, yeah. they were getting guns off the streets. Yeah. I mean, the most of the people they were picking up were blacks, but that's were the people that were leaving their house with their guns. Like don't, you know, and when they started getting strict like that, they just stopped leaving the house with their guns. You know, they left their guns mm. at home or whatever. They, they were a little bit more careful about getting picked up with one because they were really tough on it and it was safe. And like I said, I've never paid attention to the American system and now I'm obsessed with it. Like, yeah, it's, a, it's and, very, uh, and it's Trump very is, strange days. You know, I, and then I red pilled over the last five years and Trump was, you know, probably came to American politics about halfway through my red pilling about, you know, 
Well, the left just got so radical when they started saying, you know what, if you misgender someone, you're going to the human rights tribunal. I'm like, wait a second. You can't, can't make me say stuff. Mandatory or per- compelled speech is not cool. You know, first thing is, you know, but I've often heard uh, the glory days of the Bloomberg and Giuliani and the tough on crime in the streets from natives that worked and lived down there. And it was safe. It was good for business. And now I'm so in tune to these democratically run city and sin states have been the ones suffering under COVID and mm-hmm. the ones suffering with burning the city down. Yeah. Like you give me one example of like Seattle, whatever. Every time you, you talk about Chicago, they're all like, I me. Mean, and not only that, some of these cities and states have been democratic for 70 years. Yeah. Like, you know. like oh, I can't even like, I want, so I'm still learning. I'm still, naive a lot like i can carry a conversation as far as you know a political debate in canada proportional representation understand carbon fee and dividend pretty well you know i can i can speak to democratic issues like that um but when speech became my number one priority it was very clear to me that the left didn't stand for it guns i've become very passionate about don't fuck with my guns like Mm -hmm. we and now it just for me, it cements the belief because when you call the cops, like if you see down in the States now, defund the police, even though some of these changes have taken effect or whatever, when the, when the cops are busy with riots and you call them and they don't come, you're yeah. not going to protect your family or your business with a pistol. Like you need a gun. Well, the I mean, it comes for that. you. If you don't have a significant weapon and worse yet, if the government comes for you, I know that's a little bit more radical. Mm-hmm. But who thought that we'd have be riding in the streets and people would be breaking down mm-hmm. gates and running up on mansions, and then dude yeah. pulls out his AR-15 and uh, he goes he goes up on the charges like and he didn't these even de- put it at anybody. Yeah, and these you know? so for me, I just look at these democratically run, and I st- you know I blame a little bit of it on Trump because right from the beginning I'm like set the feds in, send the feds in. And I guess the only play I can see is that he thought or his people thought that it would be a bigger disadvantage, especially in election year. And I don't really think Trump cares about the fact that it's election year. He just pardoned Roger Stone. He don't fucking care. He shouldn't care about sending in the feds to well, clean up, clean up the occupied. So no, I, he should have right off the bat. But the, th- the, the thought that I get from responses to limited reaction I get on Twitter to my stuff is he just wanted them to burn. And then if their democratically led cities and, and, and states are going to let themselves burn and they're not going to call the feds in or they're going to resist the feds coming in, then it's on them. And I think, you know, he, I don't know. Well, he said today in one of his press conferences that as soon as he told Seattle they were coming in, they took care of it and they wiped them out in four hours. Right, but because this, he didn't want to take the credit for it, right? If, if he went in there and cleaned it up, which he's not, he doesn't have the legislative... Uh, no. power to do so they no, would have eh? that's an invasion on a sovereign state yeah but these like going back to what you said so i mean he could have done it though he could have just said fuck you and enrolled the tanks could have been very yeah very heavy heavy handed like that that's only happened twice in american history but uh-huh. what i would say is these democratic cities and this this blow up about the george floyd situation um I would put it the other way. These democratic cities, the people that obviously live there didn't want it to happen, but the, um, the political left, the democratic party, this was a gift. This was Christmas day for them when this George Floyd situation happened, because then right away, they completely went into, went into action with their political apparatus, their protesters, their groups, their funding, um, dial a protest. We need a protest here. We need agitation here. Make sure that their media apparatus is there to film it. And the longer it goes, the, because what they were, what it was all about is, and why I say it was Christmas, it was about motivating, agitating their, their voter base, in this case, specifically African Americans who were not excited about the Clinton election. She didn't get as many voters as she could have and wanted to and needed. And they're certainly not and weren't excited about Joe Biden, right? So if you can motivate this group of people, this demographic, um, into a posture of agitation and then direct them toward the voting booth, which they weren't planning to do, then you have a political advantage. And the thing is, um, 
unlike the Repub the Republican Party does not demographically need African Americans to win elections. That was just proven in 2016. Trump, uh, Trump, Bush got six percent of the vote or eight percent of the vote. McCain got six or eight. Uh, Trump got eight. Um, but the Democrats must have the African American voter. They will never win another election again. If if any uh, Republican candidate were to get 20 percent, just 20 percent of voting African Americans, the Democratic Party would never win another election again, because they can't get the white majority. Very rarely do they. Barack Obama did it once, maybe twice, but Kennedy did. But in general, uh, the white majority does not vote for the Democratic Party in a deal. It doesn't happen. They, need, they have a coalition. They must have the African American vote. And if they're not getting it, that's big trouble for them. So this was Christmas for them to agitate those folks, uh, upset obviously with the legitimate uh, issue of a racist, dirty cop and a murder. Um, yeah. So when the cities burn, that's good. That's good for that's good for Democrats, especially if it's Democratic city. It sounds crazy and counterintuitive, but that's exactly what it is. When their cities burn, it's good times for them politically. Yeah, it's an interesting time. I think, you know, I, I don't know. I'm heartbroken. I, I, I don't want to live in this time. I never thought this would be our time now, you know, and maybe it's not as bad as I make it out to be. And I'm sure every generation's had that time. And I joked the other day, imagine the first guy that came up and said, dude, did you try the fire? It's cool. It's awesome, man. We get it's like, it's hot and it like cooks things. And like, <laughs> you know, uh, so I think every generation's kind of said, wow, these are some weird times. Hey, you see that for that automobile they got that, you know, you know, there's always been. And so we got some strange times. I think I convinced myself that we're more polarized than ever and we're further apart than we've ever been and we're more hostile than we've ever been. And I think all of those are formed in part truth, mostly lie, because it's just the extremes, the big mouths that say the most ridiculous extreme things that have the loudest voice. And you think because they're so loud, they speak for some sort of majority or even a significant minority. And they don't. On the bell curve, they're the lunatics out here. The fat part of the bell curve where we all live, this 95% of us that are moderate that say nothing, like the but silent the majority. Problem. Like if you look historically with any great, big, powerful political movement, a very small percentage of um, the political intelligentsia of of Germany were members of the Nazi party or supporters, but they drove, they drove the agenda. The same thing in communist revolutionary Russia, right? A very small coterie of political in, in intelligentsia were driving the agenda. So you don't need the masses. You control the masses if you're passionate enough about uh, uh, getting power. So although you and I might say it's absurd for you and I to think or a common, common person to think, well, I mean, these radicals on the left right now burning cities and, and talking about speech, uh, uh, censorship and cancel culture, they're never going to get voted in, uh, you know. And But in reality, this is, and it's been said before, but I think that this is probably the most pivotal and, and, and important election in, in the history of the United States. It's, it's calling into question who the United States is going to be. Because if Joe Biden, which is just an empty vessel right now, being controlled by the radical left and we can talk about who they are and ha always have been because they're no different now than they were 70 years ago 67 100 years ago but if they get in there it's not going to be joe's joe biden's establishment um agenda that is going to be running the united states of america he's marketing himself as to be we're going to go back to normal folks bush type guy clinton type guy joe biden type guy no he's an empty vessel right now and uh the reason he, um the democratic establishment put him in place and kind of screwed over the Bernie uh, Sanders supporters was because if Bernie got in there directly, the, the elites in the Democratic Party and their donors would have zero say about what goes on with the economy. This way, they get rid of Bernie, they throw some bones to the, the radical left, and at least with Biden in there, they get a little bit of say because they have no say with Bernie and they'll have no say with Trump. So put Biden in there and they get some say. That's why they screwed the, the Bernie bros over. And uh, on uh, Super Tuesday, basically everybody fell in line with Biden and Bernie's out the door again. Again, yeah. 
And I think you're right because in 2016, and I did not, I was not a Trump fan. And like I said, I, I only said that I wouldn't expend any hate on him. I wouldn't generate anything new and I wouldn't shift any from where I have. I have my hate placed and very, I like it where it's placed right now. <laughs> so I, just, I, just, I, just, I just agreed subconsciously or whatever that I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna hate the man. And then I gave him room. Well, then he started to entertain me. And then I started getting really open to the issues, to learning about the issues like immigration and cages and guns and abortion and, and the left's position versus the right's position. And every time he came down on something, I was like, yeah, build a wall. If you've got 30,000 illegal aliens a month crossing your border, you need to secure your border. Like who wouldn't think a tight border is a good thing? We got guys there for a reason. We just don't have like areas like Roxham Road where you come and you walk across and they put you in an ambulance, take your luggage, put you in an ambulance and take you to a hotel and give you welfare. Right. But listen to this, though. There's a there's a there's there's a, a good answer to your question. You said who wouldn't think a tight border is a good thing, right? Your sovereignty. It makes sense. But think about this. Well, but do you want to control the criminal element? Number one coming in with sovereignty. Yeah, for sure. But care. I'm concerned about crime, drugs, human trafficking. Well, yeah, those are all practical issues that practical uh, and common sense uh, people like us think about. But at the end of the day, there's always a method to the madness, right? So like you said, crime coming across the border, 50% of the jails in California are filled by illegal aliens, right? So that's just a political fact. Now, Ronald Reagan was a Republican, right? Arnold Schwarzenegger was a Republican. Richard Nixon was a Republican, and they all got and held high office in the state of California. That is an absolute impossibility now, right? You, a Republican Party has, is never going to qualify to win um, a governorship or a senatorial position or uh, certainly not uh, a presidency. Why? Because California will never go Republican again, whereas it used to all the time. What changed? What changed? Well, for starters, the, uh, the Immigration and Naturalization Act of 1957, where um, basically Lyndon Baines Johnson and Ted Kennedy said, you know what, if we keep importing, importing, if we keep allowing these illegal aliens from third world countries that live down to the South, Latin countries into California, it's not going to really help us immediately. But as long as we can tell them for the next 20 years as they're having families and stuff like that, that those bad Republicans didn't want you, we do, and here's your free welfare that you mentioned, free education, everything like that, their kids will vote. Their kids will vote for Democrats, right? And they'll be raised to do so. So it's basically a gentrification of Republican voters state by state by state. That's why. And they say, well, it worked in California, let's do it everywhere else. So then they basically changed the, uh, the Immigration and Nationalization the Act to basically import third world um, immigration from every corner of the planet, which was never the case before 1957. Never. Right. Yeah, so getting back to your point of uh, being an important election and 2016, let's compare it to that. Um, I don't... <laughs> I mean, we're just getting to know Trump. He was an outsider. He's always been an outsider. Like, there's never been a less establishment president, I don't think, ever. And hands down, he gets the funniest president of all time. Oh, yeah. The guy is fucking, like, he did, the, he did a skit the other day. He acted it out. He, he strut the stage when he's t t talking about the 600 salutes. Like, I'm like, he's setting this up. He's going to come back to it, like, comedian-wise. You know how you, you set up the punchline and then you come back and it's a recall joke? Yeah. Like, I go, is he going to, is he setting this up for a recall? Sure enough. He, re, like, unbelievable. So I find him entertaining. But I think, I think your point is valid. Maybe I'm overstating it. But for, I think for the, for the first time in a very long time, there's a distinct – vision of far left and probably moderate centrist right because he's not that conservative he's not really that far right he's a, he is not but his agenda his agenda i mean you you might be familiar with pat buchanan right who ran up against daddy bush and actually took new hampshire from him he worked in the reagan 
uh, the Ford and the Nixon administration as communications director. So the Trump's platforms, 2015, 16, 17, and now, is basically Pat Buchanan's platform. The only difference is when Pat Buchanan ran on it, he didn't have the money to stop the establishment from stopping him. Whereas by the time the establishment figured out that Trump is who he is and, and that's the platform, right? It was too late. He had the money. He, you couldn't stop him. And, and remember, he went up against 17 establishment Republican candidates and the big country club Republican donors, their money followed every candidate that got wiped out. So in other words, when, when Rubio drops out, his donors went to Christie or went to Cruz or went to Bush or went to whoever, right? They were hell bent on stopping him and they couldn't because he had the money. Whereas Buchanan, he won one primary back in the day, but he's out, he didn't have the donors. They just choked him off. Trump was self-funded, $150 million of his own money right? Versus Hillary's 2.2 .2 billion, <laughs> right? Yeah. And I can't even believe I'm saying that there's, there's just a more stark contrast right now because, well, it, yeah, if you, if you look at it, Hillary wasn't far radical left Joe Biden pulled by the AOCs and the squads. Cause that's no. just like he, Bernie, the, the Bernie bros and the AOCs or whatever are, have got that guy so twisted left and he might not govern left if he ever wins. And I can't even believe that the polls are so far apart because I thought this was a slam dunk even after the pandemic, even after the, well, after the riots, it started looking, I started going, Oh geez, this, this ain't good because I thought it would look better for him to roll the tanks and say, you know what, Seattle, uh-uh not on my watch. We're taking this out. You know what I mean? And I don't know what significance that would have. And so what if it's only happened twice in American history? Fuck that. You're not oh, going to occupy six blocks of a fucking city under my watch. And no, it's disgraceful. So, I don't know. But then he's fallen in the polls now. And I can't even believe that, you know, I'm actually because it was such a, a sure lock for me that I'm actually entertaining the idea like, Jesus, what if he, what is it like? I don't need I don't think he lives until election day, to be honest with you, but <laughs> he's, he's, he's so freaking old and frail, but like, can you, there's never like, and I, you got, I love your history because I don't have that. And you talk about Buchanan and you know your stuff in the American politics and I'm so naive. I'm just getting to know it now and I'm fascinated by it, but I think you're right from the standpoint that never before have you had such a distinct far left socialist position like he hasn't said defund the cops or take down the statues, but those are the people running them, pulling the strings in the background, those far oh, yeah. tobaccos. Yeah. And then you've got the moderate center, centrist right to the right leaning Trump, who is one of the things I love about Trump is he doesn't pretend for anyone. He's just no. Trump. He never has his bad day or a good day or whatever. He's just always on and always ready for a scrap and always ready to be the underdog and always re ready to say, fuck you. And that's, I love the fact that he's the least politically correct. Like if all, like that was the first thing. Oh, you're saying fuck you to the establishment. Okay. Oh, you're saying fuck you to censorship and political correctness. Oh God, I love you. Like, I mean, so yeah, the more he opened his mouth, I'm like, Oh, hang on. Obama had cages too. Well, oh wow! I thought that was a bad thing. You know, keeping people in cages. It's like you know. When I finally looked into Black Lives Matter, I didn't know that it, you know Kaepernick was kneeling based on a lie. Like like I had to learn all this stuff for myself, and that's why this yeah, it's probably about a three or four year period of slow red pilling, right? And it started off yeah. with speech, and then you know then there was guns, and then there was abortion, and then there was gender identity, and there was all these things. And like, I just kept coming down on with the conservatives. And the funny and thing is the irony, right? You just mentioned abortion. You just mentioned guns, right? And the thing is, I mean, this is anecdotal. This is, but like when we grew up, we, I, I loved good times, right? That was a favorite show of mine, good times. Right. And that was about a family of, uh, I think it was four living in a, the projects in South side of Chicago, right. Which was in a ghetto. It was a ghetto. Then it's a ghetto now. But yet it, it has been, like you said, controlled with an iron fist by the Democrats at the at the uh, uh, the city level, municipal level, at the federal level, and of course uh, at the state level, and and their legal apparatus, right? Attorney generals, chiefs of police, mayors, gubernatorial. So the thing is, why is it that these cities, 
are in the same situation and condition they are now, if not worse, than they were the day we were four years old or five years old watching that television show. And the reason is, it's shocking because you think, well, it, like you're, you're a business person, I'm a business person. If I have a group of people that I depend on for my business, the way the Democratic Party depends on the black vote, right? I would treat those people like gold. Like we have A clients, B clients, and C clients, right? If you're a dealership, if you're a financial advisor, if you're a realtor or whatever. So you'd think, well, I'm going to treat these people like gold so they keep on coming like a good customer should and would. But in reality, they don't. They treat them like garbage. Who's the, who's the biggest recipient of abortions? Black folks in urban areas and cities, right? Who's getting killed by guns? Black folks. You Don't know? say that. That's all racist, man. Yeah. No, I know. God, for, God forbid. God, God forbid. A, a little race, race hate facts. You know, and yeah. So I've. This is, and then. I don't know. I'm just, you know, I'm. So passionate, and then thirsty for knowledge, and then I don't care if it's a Bible verse that turns me on. Which, you know, I'm not that deep into that, but or, like somebody said something the other day i'm like oh i don't know about that let's look that up really wow and that's how i came around i think i was watching crowder and he's got a really cool debate style where he'll take two people that are forked on an issue and then he backs them up to the place where they agree and then slowly tries to see you know okay so are you with me here are you still with me are you with you know and i love that style and I think that one of the first times I watched Crowder, he was doing a abortion is murder, changed my mind or something like that, right? And I realized after listening to that episode that I'd never had an educated debate on when is it life? When should you not be able to take it? You know, like, should there be a limit on when you're able to kill it? Mm -hmm. and, and I can't even believe that a radical left-wing feminist would say no i know it doesn't happen and who would want to do this but it does happen once in a while and crowder was in a planned parenthood with a hidden camera with a nine-month pregnant woman who was going to have her fucking baby taken out of her yeah how do you explain that that you're out yeah. to here how do you, you go home and they're like oh well, what happened to the baby oh i flushed it you like this is shout your abortion and this, this idea, my body, my choice, right up until the time it's crowning. And then this retard in uh, Georgia on a radio show, the governor, what's his name? Northam. I think he's Ralph Northam. Northam, dressed up as blackface with the KKK guy beside him yeah. and stuff. He was on a radio show and said live, they put, to, put the question to him. What happens if the baby live birth the abortion? What happens if the baby survives an abortion? well, we keep it comfortable and then we'll talk to the doctors and talk to the parents yeah. and, and we decide what to do. Cute. You decide what the, the, the fetus just came, as a miracle survived your attempts to kill it. And now you're going to tell it now you're, you're going to decide what to do with it. Oh, we keep it comfortable until we decide what to do with it. He said this live and yeah. no, like, well, that's just you know, Justin Trudeau dresses up like blackface. Ah, it's cool. You're cool. You're, yeah. Yeah. Right. It's cool. It's cool. It's cool. The, these radical left-wing Democrats see the most outrageous things and everyone's like, yeah, I don't know. Who cares? Like well, that, that very, never happens. That's a very important seat that he holds, right? They are not going, even, even Cory Booker and Kamala Harris asked him to step down. And then somebody probably got on the horn in the, in the Republican, I mean, the uh, Democratic uh, upper echelon and said, hey, Stop calling for him to step down. We need that seat. It's all numbers to them. He, he, a lot of people portray the left as these, these pink-haired snowflake softies. And, and they, they, they are, but they're not all a bunch of like male Starbucks employees, right? They, they have an agenda and they're passionate about it and they want power and they will stop at nothing to get it. If, like you said, he can wear a KK mask uh, or he can be black faced and he can say what he said and yet he didn't step down and he survived politically. Why? Because that's an important seat and they don't want to lose the governorship of that state. Simple as that. And Simple so just that. to, just to make sure they got an ace in the hole, they run a talent competition to recruit an AOC 
and yeah, justice, with justice the Democrats. Most speech she's ever done. She's an actress. That's like right. She, she yeah. auditioned for the job. She was the prettiest, yeah, and most uh, well -spoken. best well spoken or whatever. Yeah. From bartender to like, I, when I saw that, I go, "Come on, this is a uh, white neighborhood conspiracy theory." There's no way. And then I'm looking, I'm like, "Oh, really? Oh yeah, <laughs> they really did this." And they're 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 looking uh, the Justice Democrats, which are funded and, and put together by a guy named the Young Turks guy, Jenk Uger. They're looking he's, for he's loaded. I didn't know he was that loaded. Yeah, they're looking for other. He just lost it. He just yeah. got he, he got delusions of grandeur and tried to run in California. He got whooped. But uh, they're looking for other AOCs that they can insert. And here's the thing: before they even worry about conservatives or Republicans, they're gonna they want to do what AOC did, which is route out the centrist Democrats, who was a long-term incumbent that she got rid of a Democrat, right? Then when they clear out all the the centrists, like the guys who you might you or I might think are the Biden-esque people or Terry McAuliffe, then then they'll start coming after um, the Republican Party and, and to try and do the same thing, right? So I mean it's 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 scary, but if if you look at the things that they're doing right now, the, Repu the Democratic Party and supporting with their media apparatus, which would be CNN and MSNBC, and all the, all the major outlets, New York Times, the things they're doing and saying right now, overtly proud of it, if they were doing and saying anything anywhere near that in, say, 1955 or 1960, they would be called what they are, which is communists. Communists. <laughs> communists. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you've watched Trump and the Democrat and the Republicans are starting to do that slowly. And, and they're starting with Marxists, uh, but yeah, because and and a 17-year-old or 22-year-old doesn't know what the hell a communist is or a Marxist, right? But they should. No, they yeah. have this delusion of a utopia, a, fa a, f a fantasy that doesn't exist. It never has. And that's no, and, but they think they can create it in Chop. They think they yeah. can create it in six blocks of Seattle. And two two men get murdered. One special needs. You saw the guy crying on TV. They wouldn't even let the ambulance in to take care of the kid. He died. Yeah. And I heard that his brother was looking for him, uh, and they were moving the body. They were hiding him from his brother when he had entered the shop to find him. And then they held up the ambulance, and the kid died. Let yeah. me, uh, we'll see. I don't know. But he was special needs. His dad said he was special needs. My heart breaks every day, and I can't watch CNN anymore. I tried to watch it just because I was, well, I was broadcasting it. So I was carrying the Trump. I didn't watch all the Trump coronavirus things, but then at the, right at the end, the last couple of weeks, I started going, like, he's coming up there every day, like two and three hours in front of the cameras. He gives 45 minute speech and update. And then another hour, an hour and a half access and all questions from the media. Like he was really like, I, like as an objective, I think I'm pretty objective. Uh, you know, I, I think I'm, pretty solid foundation on some of my ideals and beliefs now because I've been over there before and I, I don't like that. <laughs> like, I mean, I've grown yeah. up and now I'm over here. I don't think I'm, I'm so movable on some stuff. I mean, a capital punishment, I may be able to be swayed a little bit here and there, but right. even that I'm like, you know what? I'm not really feeling the taking of a, another man's life. I don't care what you've done, but what was before I'm like, Oh no, you raped children. Yeah. You could. Serial killers? Nah, put them, put them, you know, but even that I've kind of switched on. And so anyways, I'm blathering now, but I, um, the, uh, the left has gone so far rad. And somebody tweeted the other day, the radical left has made, has pushed me even further right. <laughs> like, don't make me defend that buffoon Trump because he is kind of a, you know, he's a, he's not a dummy. But he's like a character. He's like a caricature. He's, you know. But don't tell me, you know, there's both good people on both sides. The, like, just stop taking them out of context because every time you do that, and the New York Times did it, just did it today. Kaylee McEnany came out and she said this, and they printed, she says, open the schools. Science is on our side. The New York Times goes, Trump wants to open the schools and won't even let science get in the way. Quote. <laughs> like, like yeah. I watched it live. It's and a, it's a regular kid, prop. Kid, that, yeah. That's... It's just like, I cannot, I just can't watch. So what I was doing, it was, that's what I was saying. So I broadcast the coronavirus update that Trump did. And then 
as soon as they were done, I'd go MSNBC, CNN, Fox, MSNBC, CNN, Fox. I'd switch all over, depending on who yeah. was on commercial, right? And then it got to the point where I couldn't watch the CNN and the MSNBC anymore because like, I'm objective enough to look at it and go, you guys are straight fucking lying. Straight oh, lies. But that's their job. Propaganda. Right? And, not real news. When he well, says it, like who? Like so, and God bless Trump because I never saw that before. I don't know how I missed it, but I did. I don't watch network news. I stopped watching network news a long time ago and even less watching American network news because I'm not in charge of what I'm seeing. So if I'm watching, you know, WKBW or whatever, or channel seven over in the States in Buffalo, it's like murder, stabbing, murder, stabbing, murder, stabbing. I don't, I can't watch that. It's, it's not good for my psyche, you know? So even the ticker on, uh, you know, CP24, can't do it. Big city. It's all fucking bullshit. It's political yeah. bullshit. And it's like, it's bad shit. And that's, you know, I started reading my, my news online and now I mostly listen to it or watch it on YouTube. Um, and I don't, I don't know. I can't, I can't believe that I was so naive to the CBC and to all the major media. And now I can't believe how overtly and blatantly like they just don't care. They have no shame. They no. never say sorry. They never retract anything. And they lie, yeah. lie, 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 lie every day. And I'm like, but like, that's like I said, I'm pretty objective, and I just can't watch it. It makes me, it makes it makes me rage with it wants me it makes me want to commit violence. Their their job, Don Lemon. their job is pure propaganda, right? So when when they're accused of by anybody of being fake news, it's not because they're up on. Well, I mean, sometimes they can, like you said, lie, but. They're not, Jake Tapper's not up on CNN saying the sun sets in the east and rises in the west, but they're fake news because basically he's there, CNN especially, they're pretending to be a legitimate news vehicle. Well, CNN's become a reality show. Right. Chris Cuomo. But, like, he, he didn't, yeah. like, did he have coronavirus? No, he broke quarantine. Like, what? You got Ron Lemon. Cuomo, it's unbelievable. And you've, got, reality show. you've got your nighttime pro prime time, which is all opinion news, right? And so is mm -hmm. Fox. So you've got Tucker, you've got. Uh, Ingram, you've got Hannity. But if you watch CNN during the day, their daytime shows, Fox has all straight news pretty much. Straight mm -hmm. news, right? Whether it's finances, foreign, whatever. You always going. have the left and the right on when they do an issue too. Usually. Yeah, but but on CNN or MSNBC, their entire 24-hour news cycle, daytime shows too, are always framed within the context and issues are framed within the context of a man bad anti-Trump, anti-Republican, anti-anything, pro-left prism, right? And, yeah, and they, they ride the fucking horse until it, it's, it's been dead for months and they're still on it. Oh, like, they went the, back the, to COVID. As soon as, the, as soon as the fires went out, they went straight and back And it was COVID. impeachment. It was Russia. It was Ukraine impeachment. <laughs> but like, like the, it's just yeah. so, and then you click over to Fox and you're like, oh, and immigration today, blah, 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 so and so. And I'm like, oh, well, this is actual, yeah, it's got a conservative slant to it. Yeah, some of it's opinion, but some of it's actually news of something else other than the, you know, the banner on the side of the world, world meters of COVID. It never leaves. And the no. scroll on the bottom, and like I watch Fox News, I, I can't turn on CNN anymore. Well, number one, because if, if I'm ever broadcasting, they, CNN's okay. MSNBC, 15 seconds, I'm shut down. Oh, I, can't even, I can't even talk over it and have the video in the background. They, like, they're just really, I think Fox is less like that. Uh, well, Harper but, did uh, a study. I, just, I have to Fox protect what I watch. Than any of them, right? What's that? Harvard, did, Harvard University did a study during the campaign. It's 2016 camp of just coverage from all the news outlets. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and um, Fox came out, I think it was 52, 54% balanced coverage hmm. all shows uh if you if you aggregate them and uh then but and all the other ones it just went downhill from there right i mean basically 70 percent, 90 percent uh liberal or unfair unbalanced coverage right but you just have to have that filter if you don't have that filter then i guess he sells it. eh? Howdy. it's not he's he's like the newspapers and the TV stations would be out of business I, like he says this very arrogantly i think he's got a point He's keep oh, yeah. he's kept these people in business. He saved some of those newspapers literally single handedly, or some just of them by being 
just by being Trump. also buried a few too, right? The Weekly Standard was a long, a long time since 2002, neoconservative, hardcore, hardline, warmongering Republican establishment rag by Bill Kristol. And basically the neocons of the Bush era, which are the same people trying to stop him from getting the nomination, they were defeated and destroyed. So they had to close up shop, which is good because if you get another Bush in there, then you're looking for global war, right? He had to basically fight the Republican establishment, not we'd be at war with Iran right now if, if they got their way. And that's part of his trouble is but he let some- what? Every issue, the house. The, when he walked it, when he crossed the DMZ, with uh, uh, Kim John Un, yeah, I'm like, well, this this is good. I like the way he's dealt with China. I like the way he deals with, you know, like every he's pulling people out. He's not. Like, Bingo. I mean, he we could have had a war with an Iran with Iran five times. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if he's just playing it up or whatever, but he pulled the jets back. They're on their way. He called okay. them off. Like, I, I don't want to go to cool. war anywhere. And he's right. like. I really respect a guy that, you know, he could cure cancer, you know, and I'm not a Trump. I'm not like I'm becoming I, my Twitter bio says reluctant Trump fan because you made me defend the man so much, taking him out of context. And then the more he speaks, the more I'm like, yeah, I'm okay with it. <laughs> I'm okay with the way he dealt with China. I'm a, yeah. Coronavirus is, I, I mean, he, he did some good things. He probably like, I don't agree with everything, but I, but what do I know? Like, Barack, I mean, come Obama, on. Barack Obama could have ran, like if, if you could go back in time and snap your fingers and, and there's an adjustment to the constitution that uh, a, a sitting president can run more than two terms, right? So pick, pick the lefty du jour you want, Bernie Sanders, Barack Obama, some other known name lefty or lower, lower grade lefty. If you took out Trump, let's say he has a heart attack or whatever, just before the campaign's supposed to start in 2015, and you insert that liberal and he runs on that same platform that Trump ran on, that guy wins. Barack Obama would be voted by Republicans into the presidency if he ran on that agenda. Because it's I, at the end of the day, when Trump's gone, a Republican runs on that, that agenda. Let's say, let's say he wins. And so now in, in four years time, we got to have a new Republican nominee. It's not going to be Mike Pence. So whoever that is just has to run on the MAGA doctrine. Be Matt Gates Again, Matt Gates, somebody like that, maybe <laughs> Troy, Troy Gowdy. It won't be a slime ball like Paul Ryan, who thinks he's actually going to do it. It won't be. And you can start seeing these characters, right? Neocons, the wings, right? So Mike Pompeo is very effective. He's done a good job. He's still there. But make no mistake about it. He's a Bush neocon. If, and he thinks he's going to run. He thinks he's going to run in four years. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. The, I, the position, I think Don Jr. has probably got a better chance than Pompeo will have. Well, I think Don's going for I think Don's going for governor of New York, if I'm not mistaken, sooner mm -hmm. rather than later. But Pompeo is just another Bush establishment. And you, we've routed out all of those uh, country club Republicans and defense hawk. How long has uh, Democrats ruled uh, New York State? Oh, gosh. Well, I mean, um, Governor Pataki, uh, he was a Republican. Um, you've got Mario Cuomo, who is the son, uh, the father of Chris Cuomo and uh, um, uh, Andrew. Andrew, and he was a, a Democrat. You had... Uh, When's the last time you had a Republican in there, though? That, if Don Jr. thinks he's going for governor in New York... Like, what are the chances he pulls that off? It'll be tough. It'll be tough. But then again, though, Cuomo's in big trouble about those old, old those uh, putting you all think? the COVID. think? These guys get away with it all the time. It doesn't matter what they do. They come out smelling like a rose. Yeah, Cuomo's not going to pay. He's more popular than any mayor in fucking the USA right now. You know what, though? Actually, yesterday, Jake Tapper actually called him to task. I couldn't believe it on CNN. And he's done it. That's the second time he's done that because that problem is not going away for Cuomo. And, and when there's a massive class action suit about, all, uh, suit about all these old folks that died in these homes. He's just Cuomo, laughing it off. Uh, no big, oh, he's trying to blame it, it on Trump somehow. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it, it would be slim to none chance. I think that Don Jr. wins. But I'd say, I'd say um, uh, New York is definitely a stronghold. Of, and so is, so is Massachusetts, for that matter, of, of the Democratic Party. It, it would be extremely tough. But that's the thing, right? It's generational. New York didn't become automatically 
Democrat any more than California did or Illinois did. It happened slowly over time. And why was the influx of third world generational immigration, right? They think these people, these Democrats are, are playing three dimensional chess with a long game like the Chinese do. But these selfish establishment, establishment Republicans of the, the Bush era, they're here for six years as a senator. How much money and influence can I get? And what's my speaking fee in my book deal going to be? And then I'm out. I don't care about the culture. And that's why the left always wins because they actually believe in something versus Republican establishment who are not conservatives at all. Any more than any more than Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden and Bill Clinton were liberals. You have the definitive left to varying degrees. You have conservatism on the or liberalism on the on the left, conservatism on the right, and then in the center politically, everybody else has no ideology. That's the swamp, right? There's no difference between GWB and uh, 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 Clinton. No difference at all with their foreign policy. Culturally, they could care less about abortion or not. Culturally, they could care less about immigration or not. In fact, the, the, the Republicans were happy to have immigration, illegal immigration all day long because it drives down wages and their big business donors love it. But culturally, they don't give a damn. They just want to basically keep the status quo, sell the world to China because their stocks go up. And that's what they did, both parties. Bernie, Bernie bros had enough of it and the conservatives had enough of it. And that's why we have what we have now. Where do you come down on the idea that these very early on in the game, they're like, Psst, hey, listen, I know what we'll do. We'll create two parties and we'll govern forever. <laughs> but guess what? We'll do the same thing. <laughs> we'll, just, we'll just take and take and take and take. You take five years, 10 years, we'll take 30, 40. You can have it back for 20, 30. And we'll just, it just, the same in Canada. Yeah. It's like well, the, conservatives the, record. The, record and the, is, the conservatives and the liberals are like more alike than they are different, it all it seems uh, like. The conservative party. You have to make stuff up to, uh, during the election to, to sort like fake shit. Oh, oh, schools and blah, 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 you know. It creates the illusion that there's two parties in, in Canada, for sure. I mean, the conservative, the conservative party in, in Canada would be more akin to um, a moderate center, center right party or a candidate in, uh, uh, in the United States or even, even in Britain, right? The, w what do they really stand for ideologically, the conservative party of Canada? You would know more about that than me. It doesn't I'm seem to me attention. that there is much difference. I know they got a leadership I mean, right this. now. I've been staying in touch with that a he little has bit. three scandals, Trudeau and his blackface leading up to uh, the election. And, and I don't know much about Sheer, but what I do know is if, 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 if Providence hands you your opponent doing blackface and three major scandals and you get caught and you can't win an election, the best you could do is take his majority, then you're an incompetent uh, a politician, whoever you are. Soft, soft. You know, I was catfished by an ex one time for months, okay, on our fake Facebook account. And I felt so fucking stupid. It was unbelievable. Having hope in Trudeau was just about as bad as that. Like, I feel like a fool that I ever bought in and even gave the time, the, the, any hope at all to that man because he's been nothing but an embarrassment to me, a gutless, corrupt lefty virtue signaling fake feminist just and you know what it's like you said you know you, you teased it oh we can talk about the democratic party's been this way for a hundred years if you want to like i just i can't believe and you know you know my buddy vez you've seen him on the show before he's done the radio show and stuff like mm -hmm. that he he's the hydro fuel guy brilliant i had him on for 20 minutes the other day and he, and he did an anti-trump rant that was beautiful it was, it, it was, it was a work of art and I just let him go. Like, I mean, what, what are you going to say? He, he had the floor. Uh, you know, <laughs> well, that's because you're a good host, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. I brain farted again. Uh, what was I, where was I going with that? Oh, oh no. no, I've never been more like I was embarrassed. I felt foolish. That's it. Foolish that I've been stupid for so long. And that's kind of how I feel with, with the Trudeau. Like well, the most, I uh, gave him, I, I fell for the whole sunny ways. I was so desperate to get rid of 
Harper. And, you know, I want your take on this too, amongst other things. I don't know how long you've got. We're coming up in an hour already. Yeah. Um, you've known me since I was a lefty. Yeah, we have. And, and get this. When I was a Green Party candidate five or six or seven times, or, you know, I ran for leadership in 06. And that was a great time. I was really connected to the party. We recruited, not me, we, I, w I didn't have all that. The, the party recruited Elizabeth May specifically for star power. She was the dream. We never had anything like it. It, it was our David Suzuki. You know, yeah. Not that I, you know, whatever. And so there was a faction of the party that because David Chernochenko and her were running and they were friends, they didn't want it to be a handholding session. They wanted to talk about some of the issues and I could do that. I could bring the horse trading issues up in the debates and I could, I could, I could talk about things that people thought that they would. And it was fun. It was good times. The summer of 2006, August 26th, you know, a speech from Ottawa, from a packed house, a convention, five, 600 people for the greens. That was like unbelievable. CPAC mm. broadcast it live. I had 28 minutes on stage. It was cool. It was a good time. You knew me and you've been conservative your whole life since I've known you. I don't know if you, if you, yeah. you, you just, just kind of say you're, and I didn't know this. Jordan Peterson helped me with this. You're actually born liberal and conservative for the most part. I, and I have Ben will be a buddy of mine. I spar with on Twitter all the time, like a good friend of mine who's, who is radically different than me politically said, Jimmy, I always thought you were a conservative. You're just pretending to be green. That's fascinating. Yeah. He says, you're a realtor. You're a business guy. You're whatever. But I always thought it was a joke that you're a green. I didn't know. I was just, I got recruited and then I got programmed. And then I was actually, once I took it seriously, I actually got pretty good at being a candidate, you know, for, you know, women's choice. And the left needed a guy like me. Well, not in 93. I didn't do very much. I shit the bed. I did one debate and I went the bed. I went for my voice and it was gone. Pete Marina put the mic over to me. I drew the first straw and I had to speak first. And I went like this. <laughs> Nothing came out. I'm like, <clears throat> I coughed and there was no sound. And then I just like sweat. If it wasn't, I just went full body sweat. It was the scariest thing I've ever done. But back then it was an ideological fantasy dream. Like I'm helping out the greens at that time. 93 it was uh, Brian, Brian Mulroney was, you had to have 50 candidates run nationally or they, you get deregistered. Uh -huh. And so I got recruited as one of those 50 some odd candidates that kept the party alive. And I, I did it on the understanding that I would not debate because I didn't know anything about politics in 93. I was 24. Yeah. Who does really when it comes right down yeah, to and it? And I'm running in Welland Center. And I'm like getting, I'm walking to get signatures and people are slamming the door in my face. They thought it was a fucking joke. Mm -hmm. My family thought it was a joke. Green Party is so fashionable now, but I really bought into the idea that, no, the planet needs a representative. No, the election system's broken. No, there's too much subsidies for but big oil and fucking, what are we doing all this stuff? It's just, it's not, it's like seeing one of those dolphin commercials where it's just, it's just wrong. Like, you know what I mean? One turtle, oh, fucking, pull a fucking straw, the turtle's nose. Oh, we got to got paper, paper straws now. Are you fucking kidding me? Like, seriously. Anyway. You knew me, I was a lefty. And I just, this is just becoming obvious to me now. I just saw a friend of mine at the mansion house the other day. His father was a conservative player. I'm not going to say who it was, but a, a big conservative player. Mm -hmm. In 06, or one of the years I ran, Dykstra, I was running against Dykstra. He was, had a, he was I think, the conservative party uh, president. And my mother didn't go to my debates because she didn't, she wasn't really into politics, but this happened she was at the parkway. And, you know, I want, she knew it was important. That I wanted her to be there regardless if she understood any of it or not, which she didn't. Sure, of course. Um, and so she's in the back of the room and buddy comes over and he says, uh, Hey, Claude, don't tell anyone I'm voting for this kid because he deserves it. He's killing nice. him up there. And he goes, I don't know, he, you know, president of the, whatever. And I always thought in that, in that moment, my mother went from, Oh, he's not a joke. Like she, she kind of thinks I'm doing a good job up there and I know my stuff, but she doesn't know the topics I could be bullshitting. Right. Right. And, um, anyways, I have, I started to get good at it. And then anyways, I was, the conservatives was always fond of me. They would always come out. Of course the radical left love me there's you know they just finally they're just happy to have a guy they can vote for because the ndp didn't do it and i say radical left but whatever 
the uh, environmentalist, yeah, they're happy to have a guy that can actually stand and debate. Which is a very important, right? Presentation is key in politics. Oh, absolutely. And I just happened to have the personality type. Like I wasn't, I worked hard. I went to Toastmasters. That's why Trudeau won though. That's why. I trained to get this way so it wasn't scary anymore to take the microphone. Like I worked on it because it it fucking, it it paralyzed me, literally paralyzed me. And so what I've just come to know is I've lost so many friends now because of my stance on the things we just discussed. Long time, good boy and girlfriends. Mm-hmm. I mean, not intimate girlfriends. I mean, they're, they're in for the long haul, mostly even if they're ex-girlfriends because we have that connection. But I mean, like a, a girlfriend of 20 years the other day, just, and w- what are you going to tell me when you're breaking up with me for? If you're just going to unfriend me, unfriend me. I won't even notice. Yeah. But they got to give you a long thing and how a piece of, of shit. You used to be cool. And you used to be smart. What happened to you? And fuck you. And you're unfriended and boom, they're gone. Or they block you or whatever. And my they buddy, that parting shot, right? Yeah. My high school friend, same thing. So I realized that when I was a lefty, the left liked me and the right respected me and treated me cordially. And they, they liked me. We could go for beers with the right, the mm-hmm. conservatives, like any time. I didn't hang with the lefties too much because, yeah, to come to think of it, they were never my speed, even, the, even though I was the man for so many elections. And I mean, the man from the standpoint, like I was the man, I was the campaign manager, I was the fundraiser, I was the communications director. I was, you know, it was until 2008 that we had some money. We actually had an office and we had a really cool thing going. But now, since my politics have shifted, suddenly I'm a monster. I'm a guy that used to be a cool guy, but now because I think Black Lives Matter should be terror, uh, classified a terror organization because basically I think they're Marxist, you know, propagandists. I mean, we don't even have yeah. to speculate, right? It's, it's, it's right there. The co-founder just says we're trained Marxists. If you yeah. can't believe her, who do you want to believe, right? So it just occurred for me that my, my righty friends never, I've always been good with them. And now the left hates me. Absolutely. The, the, the guys that, that skulk me on my, on my uh, wall all the time, mostly Green Party people. They might know me or they might not know me, but they are enraged. I told a guy the other day, I'm like, eh, just off the hand about a year ago. I'm like, yeah, to be honest with you, I like Trump more every day. He goes, <laughs> I want to punch you in the face. I'm like, are you He says, seriously, I want to punch you in the face. No, this because guy doesn't, mind, though, he doesn't know shit easy. about politics. I've run 10 elections and I can actually debate the issues fairly intelligently. Bingo. They don't, that doesn't matter, though. And they, they don't know anything about anything. I go, you, listen to me. You've known me for how long? Your whole life. Okay, good. Do you think I'm a political idiot? No, not until you said that. I didn't. I'm like, boom. <laughs> it's You're so frustrating. You're not somebody disagreeing with them because they are intolerant of other opinions. They're for free speech as long as it is a speech that is touting what they're saying or in, in an agreeable tone, right? You have, if you, if you tow their party line, you're all good. If you don't, then you're an enemy to be destroyed. Whereas conservatives don't look like, like that. They want your free speech, my free speech, and they'll fight for their political enemies free, free speech at the same time. See the left used to be all about peace, love, marijuana, and free speech. When I was growing up, it was cool. Like when I was younger, never not that. into politics, no? It was never about that, no. No, eh? No, that's the, the, the new... Give us a breakdown talk- of the history of the Democratic Party then. <laughs> well, we can do that next time for sure, because <laughs> we're talking about who the left is and who the right is and what they mean, mm-hmm. right? Cool. What they're all about, because who they are now has never changed. You, like, who they are right now, we're saying, wow, we, who are these people? We've never heard of those, and there seems to be lots of them now or whatever. But those are just the foot soldiers, the people running those people are the same people that they were 25 years ago, mm. 50 years ago, 75 years ago. And if you want to think about it, we can talk all the way back to the French Revolution where the word left and right came to fruition. That's, That's right. why we call I'd people. forgotten that fact. I actually knew yeah. that at one time. Yeah. Yeah. How did I ever, why would I ever think to look that up? Yeah, I've forgotten that. Cool. Awesome point. Brother, I love you, man. Yeah, Thanks man. This time. is great, dude. Yeah, no, it's, we Thanks killed an hour pretty quickly. I think uh, it did. That's a good thing. Yeah, and and I'm not like we could we could do another hour with no trouble. 
Like, <laughs> seriously, I'm not running out of stuff, you know, but I appreciate your time and I always try and keep you on time. I got you eight, eight minutes. Yes, sir. Long here, so. Awesome. Oh, I got something I want to show you. Check this. Love you it. Recognize, recognize that? Who dares wins, buddy? It's yours. Is it really? Yeah. You got to be kidding me. This is yours. Yeah. <laughs> That doesn't surprise me. <laughs> I kept it for you. I All knew right, you'd well, want it back. Sooner or later, buddy. Sooner or later. Okay. Everybody <laughs> needs that book. Yeah, another 10, 15 years, I'll get it back to you. All right. Sounds what good. is that? Who dares? Oh, yeah. Who dares wins? Yeah. What is that? That's the British Special Air Service, the British Special Forces. So they've got a, they've got a survival security handbook. for yeah survival for any they're like the like the uh, they're the Navy SEALs of England except better. <laughs> and on that note, we're gonna <laughs> shut you down if YouTube hasn't already. Thank you uh, for watching. Anybody All that right, was bro. watching, and thanks for your time, brother. I love you. We'll talk Take soon. Take care. Talk soon. Rob Thomas, everyone. I'm out. Cheers, Peace. Buddy. Ciao. Peace.